Today's lecture is about ecology, it's about conservation, and it's about public policy. And I can think of no one better to, to give us that lecture than uh, Professor Mark Mangel. He's a professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz. For many years, he was at the University of California in Davis, and has had numerous prizes and fellowships uh, awarded to him. His PhD was at the University of British Columbia, working with Colin Clark, and he has an uh, undergraduate degree from the uh, University of Illinois, I believe, in, in physics. He's a, a mathematician, applied mathematician par excellence, and, uh, and, and it's it, no exaggeration for me to say he's the most outstanding biomathematician of his generation, in my opinion. And so uh, it's, it's really a great honor for us to have him visit here today and to have that perspective that he has in terms of 30 years of research, in terms of thinking about the issues of ecology, biology, and doing it in a mathematical modeling framework, to then provide his insights in terms of public policy. Uh, I think it's truly a, a, great, a great pleasure for us all to, to, to enjoy that. So if you could please join your hands with me and uh, give an applause and welcome to Professor Mark Mangan. It's always a pleasure to come to Australia. I don't get to do it that frequently, uh, but uh, have great times when I'm here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how ecology, conservation, and public policy can be linked, particularly in the 21st century. These ideas have been developed over many years with colleagues, Don Ludwig and Brent Haddad, with many of my own students and postdocs. Uh, the list is too long to name. So the fundamental question, I believe, is how we do first-class basic science on important applied problems. Now, when I was a graduate student, as uh, Quentin mentioned, in the mid to late 1970s, the answer of many of my colleagues was, why bother at all? Let's just do good science. And I will say that many of these people, when they turned 45 or 50, had uh, a midlife crisis in which they woke up and realized that they had been taken from society for 30 years and now wanted to give something back but did not know how to do it. Here's another answer to the question. Silent Spring, written in 1962 by Rachel Carson, which started the uh, environmental movement in the United States, according to John McNeil, an environmental historian, is the most important book ever written by an American. If you've never read Silent Spring, it is one of the two book recommendations that I will give to you today. So I encourage you to find a copy and read it. So the, the question is, how do we bring first class science to uh, important applied problems? The answer to that question is not completely clear, but some parts of it are clear. And as the advertisement for the talk said, I will actually try to answer this question with another series of more specific questions. How do environmental problems differ from the other uh, problems that we study in science? How do we deal with uncertainty? How does science support policy making? And what should we and how do we learn from other disciplines? So more or less that's the outline of the talk. To begin, environmental problems are wicked. Now that's a, a particular definition going back to a very old paper by uh, Riddle and Weber in uh, 1973. Some of the characteristics of wicked problems are listed here. They're vague. They're kind of the word problems that you studied in high school but not clear. You don't know when you have an answer. You don't know how to stop and say, I'm done. You don't know if solutions are right or wrong. That's not even the, the issue. Solutions are either good or bad, depending upon definitions. And there are many ways of looking at the problem. There are multiple stakeholders, and so there are pluralities of perspectives. John Maddox was the editor for Nature magazine for many, many years, and at the end of the 20th century, he wrote a book entitled What Remains to be Discovered, which is actually a misnomer for what's in the book. But in that book, he noted that the best environmental policy depends on how one frames the question. So these wicked problems are very difficult to grab onto. They're amorphous. 
to begin, they're really not dealt with by optimizing. And in fact, they're not dealt with by managing. For example, nobody manages climate change. El Nino, and as we have seen in the last four months, nobody manages the economy. I mean, nobody even knows what they're doing to try to intervene in the economy, as uh, we know. Now, that doesn't mean we can't do something about these, but we certainly don't manage them. For that reason, uh, one of the things I encourage is that we remove the phrase ecosystem management from the dictionary. We might refer to ecosystem-based management, but we will never manage ecosystems. What we manage is human intervention in ecosystems. And the sooner we admit that, the better off we will be. Wicked problems often lack clear stopping rules. For example, in endangered species recovery, there's no easy scientific answer for when a recovery is complete. We can write legislation about when a recovery is complete. And usually in the United States, of course, that's written by congressional staffers who have no formal scientific training, who have conferred with scientists trying to understand uh, what this means. An example of who manages climate change and some of the thorny issues associated about it deals with the decline of the stellar sea lion, shown here on the left, in uh, the uh, western Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea. There I've shown to you the population trajectories for the stellar sea lion censuses for which the entire population was censused from about 1980 until 2005. And we have recently published a paper in ecological applications in which we tried to look at all the different hypotheses in a way that I'll explain to you momentarily associated with the declining population of stellar sea lions. One of our conclusions is that the stellar sea lions declined because the North Pacific Ocean went through a regime shift. The North Pacific Ocean I apologize, I should I'll say the uh, eastern side of the Pacific Ocean in the north exists in two states which alternate on a very, very slow time scale, a period of about 50 to years. And one of these uh, states is favorable to herring, a very oily and rich fish. And one of them is favorable to pollock, a very dry, flaky white fish. We know in the laboratory or in tanks, one can feed stellar sea lions as much of pollock as they want and they will lose weight. It would be like allowing you to eat celery only and as much celery as you wanted. Nobody controls the flipping of the North Pacific between these two states, between a herring dominated state, which is very good for stellar sea lions, and a pollock dominated state, which is not. There are other aspects of the problem too, but this particular result, whoops, oh, it says right there, this particular result was liked neither by environmentalists who like to sue the fishery service because they're not doing their job, and, or the fishery service because the fishery service couldn't manage anything to do their job. Right? So this is an example of a wicked problem for which we have to admit the reality of what's happening but that there's very little management we can do on a very large scale. Wicked problems are bathed in uncertainty and I believe that there's a principle of irreducible uncertainty which is no matter how much science we do, there will always be some remaining level of uncertainty. And that means if we want to deal with such problems, we need to think about data and how data are interpreted. The uh, classical approach to thinking about data is something called frequentist statistics, and it is done with hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing, or more formally, no hypothesis significance testing, begins by thinking of the phenomenon you're interested in, trying to formulate a question as the opposite 
of what you're interested in, and then disproving the opposite. Thereby never proving, of course, what you're interested in, but presumably disproving the counter proves in some way what you're interested in. Here are some examples in environmental and social science that uh, were formulated as null hypotheses and then rejected. Now, I won't read these to you. You can equal, uh, read them yourselves. But with each one, as you see, the statement of the hypothesis is actually contrary to what clearly the scientist was interested in. Right? In the first one, the scientist was interested in how she remains very seasonally in coyote scat. Or in the last one, we're interested in how driving, uh, or how aging <coughs> leads to driving secession and then out of home activity in the elderly. So in each one of these cases, the null hypothesis is the opposite of what we're hoping to understand. The fundamental problem with null hypothesis significant testing is the following. What we really want to know is, the, is that if we have collected some data and we have a vision of how the world works, a model, a theory, we want to know, given these data, what is the probability that the null hypothesis is true. But what null hypothesis statistics a significance testing tells us is if the null hypothesis were true, what would be the probability of getting these or more extreme data? Which is why one flips the wording when creating the null hypothesis. Now, if I can uh, use a little bit of mathematics, although this is in a public lecture, th this Symbology is intended to represent the probability of the hypothesis given the data. That's what we really want for scientific and consequently environmental understanding. And what we get from no hypothesis statistic is the probability of the data given the hypothesis. Now this problem has been recognized for a very, very long time, at least uh, 50 or 60 years, as you see from the quotation from Frank Yates there. The trouble was that there were really few alternatives to it that were practicable until the, uh, really the end of the 20th century. And now there are alternatives. And these are called likelihood and Bayesian methods. So uh, again, for the young ones in the audience, I would say you should learn likelihood and Bayesian statistics if you want to be involved in this kind of work. And basically, the notion is that we are always comparing hypotheses. So when we get a piece of data, we think of it as evidence relating one hypothesis to another. So ultimately, we would like to be able to answer questions such as, given a, a piece of data, what is the probability of observing that data if hypothesis A is true or if hypothesis B is true? If the probability of observing it when A is true is bigger than when B is true, we would think that the observation, the data, support hypothesis A more. And the ratio of those two values measures the strength of that evidence. Now, in the last 10 or 15 years, an enormous literature has developed around these things. But in fact, the notion goes back at least to the end of the 19th century when Thomas Chamberlain, a geologist, in his presidential address to the Geological Society of America, said we should always have multiple working hypotheses. When we think about a a problem in the world, we should always have multiple explanations and ask questions such as, when I have two or more hypotheses and an observation, what do I now believe given that I have these data? What should I do next given that I have this observation? And how do I interpret this observation as evidence 
trying to understand the hypotheses. This entire approach is something that I call uh, ecological detection. And uh, as you see, uh, in a bit of self-promotion, there is a cover for a, a book you can buy. Not one of my book recommendations, I might add, uh, although somebody can recommend it to you later. Uh, but this is, I think, fundamental to understanding environmental problem solving. <clears throat> and in actual fact, one can begin to structure models and equations using Bayesian and likelihood methods that allow us to deal with uncertainty and information in a very consistent framework and be honest about the things that we don't know. The next thing we need to think about is how does science support policy making? For example, one may think of conservation biology as providing the scientific context for understanding policy decisions. Now, where I come from, uh, people rarely acknowledge successes of uh, conservation, so I thought I would begin by pointing out a few such successes. This is, well, this is John Steinbeck, and I might mention that his uh, great book, the, the Grapes of Wrath, is 70 years old this year. And this is Ed Ricketts, who uh, was a marine ecologist working in Monterey Bay and uh, what is now called Cannery Row, if any of you have ever been to Monterey. And this is the Pacific Sardine. This is the... Uh, trajectory of estimated spawning biomass of sardines from uh, the late 1920s when the fishery began through uh, about 2000. And this trajectory actually continued to climb. So you see uh, a drop during World War II, uh, a peak uh, as the war ended, another drop subsequent to the war, and then a very, very low biomass. The biomass is clearly not zero there, but it was less than uh, 20,000 metric tons, and that notch is 500,000. In 1972, a moratorium was put on directed fisheries for sardines, and as you see, the trajectory started to increase in about 1984. That era was actually the year that I began to work on sardines. And it's just coincidental, I think. This recovery continued, and one of the remarkable things is we could not explain the strength of the recovery. That is, the steepness of this line belied all of the biology that we understand about sardines. There are many other cases in which we have been successful. So one of the things I would say is we should not always be wringing our hands because from successes we can learn things that could be applied to other systems. In addition, science is not always needed to understand consequences. This is the uh, uh, picture of a section of ocean before a bottom trawler went through. And this is a, the same section after, before and after. And it's clear one doesn't need science or hypotheses testing or Bayesian analysis to conclude that bottom trawling was not good for this section of the ocean. So we need to think about when science can contribute and when it cannot. And to do this, we have to separate environmental science and environmentalism. I will talk a little bit more about environmentalism right now, but I mean later, but for right now, I would simply refer to it as science by assertion. Two examples uh, from the United States are marine stock enhancement, the notion being that one will raise juvenile fish. In this particular case, in of Florida, it's snook. One will raise juvenile fish in a hatchery, throw them into the ocean, and that will increase catch for the commercial and, and sport fishermen. 
in this particular issue of uh, Florida Sportsman, there was an editorial in which you see the uh, editor was writing an editorial on Snook and simply crossed out failure and said that the marine stock enhancement was a success. As if asserting it actually meant it was a success. The other uh, case in the United States where there has been enormous blurring of the line between environmental science and environmentalism has been in the study of marine reserves where numerous scientists have asserted very vehemently that marine reserves would always increase fishery yields. This is not just true for uh, scientists. This is an article from a scuba diving magazine about the myth of diver, diver damage. This was, a, this was an article about the Dry Tortugas Reserve, which was closed as part of being a marine reserve to divers. And the divers objected, saying divers never do damage. Now, I don't know how many divers there are in here, but uh, I've, I've dove on numerous occasions commercially with, with people who were uh, certified two days before that and have watched them wreak havoc. Asserting that divers don't do damage is very different than divers not actually doing damage. With the marine reserves, one ended up having the line blurred to the point that scientists were talking about slogans, such as 20% by 2020. Does anybody in here remember that slogan from about a decade ago? Right. That if we just put 20% of the world's oceans in marine reserves by the year 2020, everything would be fine. A number of uh, my papers in the late 90s were dedicated to trying to point out that whether a 20% reserve did or did not do something for a stock depended on the biology of the stock and the definition of do uh, something for the stock or not. But as soon as a scientist crosses the line between environmental science and environmentalism, he or she often ceases to be an effective scholar. Next, we need to understand the policy process. This is, of course, a uh, U.S. view, and presumably one can uh, change the, the wording a little bit to adjust it for Australia. But policies are... In, expressed by the goals of our leaders, by the staff of government agencies, by the actual laws that we have, and by the practices of administrative agencies. <clears throat> so that policy can occur anywhere within the executive, judicial, or legislative branches. And if one wants to work at this interface, one needs to understand how the policy process proceeds. Most importantly, when policy and science interact, both can become distorted. And I would like to uh, give two examples. One, a uh, uh, marine mammal example, and then one uh, terrestrial example.
In the, uh, in the late 1980s, Japanese scientists came to the International Whaling Commission saying that they had to catch 252 whales for scientific whaling that year. And the reason for ca having to catch 252 whales was that they needed to have